Lord, we are, we are your children, and we sometimes struggle with what that means in a world that uh, increasingly um, offers us so many different paths forward. God, as we've been walking through the book of James, James has pulled no punches when he talks to the early church about what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. But yet the words from this ancient book still speak to us today. And I pray, God, as we wrestle with one of James's most controversial, one of his most difficult uh, teachings, I pray, God, that in, we would we would be children before you that would hear your words and would be transformed for it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and welcome. If you're visiting with us, we want to say welcome with you, uh, welcome to us, welcome to you, welcome to you, to us. It might be one of those Sundays. Uh, we want to continue on a series that we started off a few weeks back on the book of James. What we are trying to do is we're trying to walk through the book of James and kind of capture uh, a little bit of what James is saying to the early church. Now, just one of the things you have to be reminded. Remember, the book of James is the first letter to go out to the church. It was written in the first year that the church was established. And the reason that's important is because it's a letter that's not about any theological issues. It's not about high Christology. It's not any of these type of things. It's about practical living in of their faith. And so James comes across very different than other letters by Paul, um, by Peter, because it's dealing with uh, how we live out our faith in the world. Remember, the book of James was written when the church was spread out across the Roman Empire in Acts chapter 8. And so James is saying this letter out. It's not to any particular uh, church geographically. It's not to any particular uh, group of people. It's just to Christians across the Roman Empire. And so what they would do is they would send it out, and in, in, in home churches, they would just read it and, and, and make a copy of it and then send it on. And so what's, it, what's important about James is that you have to kind of capture the very practical nature of that. And I say that to you because this morning, as we kind of dive into what we want to talk about with the book of James, James is going to offend us a little bit this morning, and he's going to push us, and you need to remember that. Um, Let's recap what we talked about last week. We looked at this, um, this great article about this popular myth. Remember we read this? It said this. A, cu- a current popular myth in evangelical circles is that salvation is based on a personal decision for Christ and that such a decision may or may not result in a changed life. Remember we talked about last week how James was really trying to get us to understand that we hear and we do. We listen and we obey. He's trying to make for us this this math formula we kind of looked at uh, about we want to listen and we want to learn, but we also want to behave. We also want to act on it, right? And James tells us that this is a transformed life. Remember we talked about how uh, James talks about in James chapter 1 verse 24, right? The orphans and the widows. And people love the orphans and widows, but... Connected in that verse is, do not be corrupted by the world. And so what James is, throughout his letter, he's trying to align the, in, the inner life of a, of a follower of Jesus to the outer life. He's trying to make sure that both of them are in alignment. We looked at something called the Shema. The Shema is uh, the Hebrew understanding of listening and obeying. And one of the problems with um, us being Gentiles, us being displaced from the Jewish context of the Bible is that James's letter is written, remember, to Jewish Christians. The early church was primarily a Jewish movement up until the book, uh, sorry, up until chapter uh, 15 of Acts. And at that time, Acts chapter 15 is this conversation about Gentiles. What do we do with Gentiles? They don't understand our, our dietary laws. They don't understand our traditions. They don't understand any of that part. So how do we integrate Gentiles into what was primarily an offshoot of Judaism? Right? And so what's important is when, when, when James is writing this letter, he's writing to Jewish people spread across the Roman Empire. And the Jewish person understands the Shema. The Shema is this idea in Exodus where Moses gets in front of the people and he reads this out to them. Right, And the Shema is this idea of hearing and obeying. And the problem is, is in a Western context, when we listen, we just listen. We don't actually say, oh, this is something I should, I, li- I should listen to and obey or listen to and act. But to the Hebrew, the Shema was you listen and obey. And your obedience was how you showed that you listened. And so that's what we talked about last week. This morning, we're going to jump into uh, a portion of James's letter that is really going to push us a little bit. But before we do that, I just want to share this uh, really interesting kind of uh, story. So 
there's this uh, tight rope walker named Blondin. It may have, you may have heard of him. He's kind of walked across the Niagara Falls escarpment there. George Sweeting, in his book on James, uh, told the story of Blondin, the great tight rope walker. He says this, while performing on a cable across Niagara Falls, he asked his audience, how many believe I can walk across this tight rope pushing a wheelbarrow? To which the people cheered loudly. And he says this, how many believe I can push the wheelbarrow across the cable with a man in it? Again, there came a loud response. Blondin then pointed to one of the most enthusiastic man in the audience and said, you're my man, now get in the wheelbarrow. Needless to say, the man made a quick exit. So what is interesting about this story and what he's trying to say here is we can always, we can always say, I believe. I believe. Yes, Blondin, I believe you can push a wheelbarrow across this, this very small rope across the Niagara Falls. I believe that you can do it. And I believe if you plunge to your death, I will be here just so heartbroken that happens. But at least I will be safe while you do it, right? So what was interesting, he's in front of his audience, like, how many people believe? Like, yeah, I believe, Blondin, I believe you can do it, yeah. And he's like, okay, so you believe. Now, who wants to go with me? And everyone's like, I don't think so. I don't think my insurance covers this. I, I, I just had a big meal. I'm feeling a little gassy right now. I don't know if I can do this. I think I'm going to pass on it, right? What was interesting about this moment is that we have this idea in our culture. We have this idea in our minds that we can believe something, but that belief may not actually change our behavior. We can believe in something. We can believe a statement. We can believe a thought. We can believe a concept. But does that actually change us with it, right? So it's this idea of saying, God's saying to us, how many of you believe that Jesus says this and, 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 and God promises that? I'm like, yeah, we can, we can go to worship services. We get excited. We can go to church services. Yeah. But on Monday morning or immediately following afterwards, do we actually behave or act differently? Now, the reason I want to set this up is because this morning we're going to jump into uh, the book of James chapter 2. So you have your Bibles. You can get James chapter 2 out. James chapter 2 is a very difficult chapter. And you're going to see why in a moment. Because James is going to say something. And it's James chapter 2 that Martin Luther, the great reformer, this is where he stands up and goes, oh, I don't think so. Remember, I've showed you the last couple of weeks how Martin Luther did not like the book of James. As a matter of fact, last week I showed you a quote from one of uh, Luther's uh, uh, sermons where he said, you can have the book of James in your Bible, but for me, I'm never going to preach from it. I'm never going to touch it because I don't like it, right? And remembering Luther has a reason for that. Remember, Luther, a Catholic priest, was taught at that point in time in history, in the 1500s, that you earned your salvation by all these things that you did. Luther reads the book of Romans and sees this idea of, of, of salvation by belief. And we go, yes. And then Luther comes along and reads James. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean? And so we're going to dive into this and we're going to kind of see how we understand it. And we're going to kind of wrestle with it a little bit. But before we do that, we kind of have to, um, we have to kind of go past uh, 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 the preview to that. So James chapter 2, verse 1, James sets up the chapter this way, and he says this. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Remember I said last week that whenever James used the word dear, he's about to punch you. Right? So James doesn't come across as very soft. And so when he says, my dear... When he says, my dear brothers and sisters, he's, he's setting you up because he's, he's about to unload on you, right? And so what's interesting in chapter 2, verse 1, James starts off by talking about this idea of favoritism. And he unpacks it this way with this example. For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't that discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? A couple of things about this, which I think is kind of interesting, is one, is that when we elevate or denigrate people, we miss the heart of God towards humanity. One of the interesting things about early Christianity was it took people from different segments of culture, whether it be a wealthy Roman or an, and, and a slave. Um, could you imagine if you were a slave in the Roman Empire? And again, slavery is this concept we have in our minds, but we have to go back to ancient times where it was common practice. And this person, the slave, was owned by individuals. Could you imagine a slave and a slave owner being in the same Bible study group? Like, how does these two individuals find unity? 
right? How do they find unity? And so James says that when we show favoritism towards one person over the other and whatever classification, whatever way we want to look at it, James says this is actually missing out the heart of God. The second thing I want to point out here is what is interesting is that James feels this is an important issue for the fledgling church. If I told you that we're starting a company or we're starting a group and, and all of a sudden that group gets scattered across the way, what do you want that group to know? What's an important thing you want to teach them? Do you want to teach them about Jesus and about how he's the son of God? Do you want to teach them about his divinity and his humanity, his miraculous power? Do you want to teach them about what it means to, be, to love one another? But James goes, no, no. Before I tell you anything else, because remember, this is the second chapter of his letter. He says, just so you know, favoritism, it actually goes against what God wants for this world. It actually breaks the, the covenant that God is trying to create in this new concept called the church. Now look at verses 5 and 7. Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? So look what James is doing here. He's taking this concept of, of, of the wealthy or the rich or the affluent, the desired person, the desired convert. He's saying, listen, these people that you admire so much, they don't even represent what Jesus wants. You're so desperate to have them come to your church, your community, to be part of your group, but you don't realize they don't even think Jesus is that important. You give them a lot of attention, but they're actually not that important in God's eyes. Now watch this, okay? The rich, powerful, and famous have always been the desired converts. James believes that the kingdom is built by outcasts. One of the reasons why the early church grew so quickly is it didn't go to the affluent. It didn't go to the wealthy and the rich. They were invited. Please hear me clearly. They were not saying, no, you can't. But inherent to being a Christ follower is this idea that you must take whoever you are and submit it to Jesus. Whatever that looks like, however. So it doesn't matter how elevated you are in the culture. And one of the things that kind of struck me about this passage as I was reading it is, you know, whether it's by Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, wherever, we have celebrities. And we love celebrities. We love them. We're fascinated by them. We're revolted by them. We admire them. We follow them. We listen to them. If someone tells us to clean our room, suddenly we're going to clean our room and empty our houses. If someone tells us we need to eat this, we're going to eat that. If someone's wearing this, we want to wear that. We love celebrities. But the thing is, though, that's how our culture operates. The problem is, is whenever the culture seeps into this thing called the body of Christ, the church. And in Christianity, we have celebrities. We have, we have people that we want to admire. We have people we want to come to our church. We want people to be a part of what we are. We have celebrity pastors. We have celebrity writers. We have celebrity musicians. We have all these celebrities. And if the celebrity all of a sudden puts out a song or says Jesus' name, then all of a sudden people get excited. Oh, there might be a Christian. It's like, are you sure about that? Are you really sure that they are, are, are they're a good representation? And what always bites us in the... In, 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 in parts of us, uh, what, what, what tends to kind of get, uh, go against us is these celebrities can often say really dumb things. And somehow we've elevated them as being spokespeople for what a Christ follower looks like, and they see something really stupid, and we're like, well, they're rich, so they're dumb, so we're okay with that, right? They're really pretty to look at, so we're going to ignore this other stuff. Or they, they, they fly around the world, they have lots of followers, so we're going to ignore the fact that they actually don't go to church or live a sacrificial life or have taken up their cross or just doing anything that a basic Christian would do. We're going to ignore all that, but man, aren't they pretty to look at? Look at their concerts, there's so many people there. And what James is saying is that we have kind of taken this idea of, of favoritism. We would love for these people to be part of our Jesus club, right? I remember when I was in high school, um, we, we, we had a, uh, we had a uh, uh, I, I can't remember what, what name we called it. It was a really dumb one, but it was, it was a Jesus club, right, in, in, in high school. And some of you may know, and, and, and 
if you've been part of that or, or, or whatnot. So it was my, myself, actually, and this other guy named Jeff. He, he and I were the guys who were trying to create this group. And the group had kind of fallen off a little bit. Had gotten a whole bunch of homeschoolers in it. So we had to kind of revive it back and bring people who were not home. No, I'm teasing. A little. Um, and so we were trying to get people to come to our, our thing. So we thought, okay, hey, if we give out free pizzas, people are going to come to our Jesus group. And that, that one said on, on the announcements, like, hey, you know, this club is going to be having free pizza. And we had lots of people come in. And, and, and some of the cool people came in. Like, like you know, some of, the, some of the jocks and some of the cool kids. And they're, like, coming in. We're like, oh, hey, and hey, we meet every week and all that. And I'm like, yeah, where's the pizza? Uh, it's over there. And, then, you know, they got the pizza and then they leave quite quickly. And I just remember thinking to myself, oh, if we could just get a popular person in part of our group, then people will start to come. Wouldn't that be fantastic if we could get somebody really pretty or someone really famous or someone really athletic, you know, the captain of this team or, or that individual, they would just love Jesus. Well, then, you know, then people would love to be part of our group. Now, the problem with this thinking is, it's always been those who are affluent, those who are wealthy, those who are famous. They're the ones that have a harder time with Jesus. Do you remember that one story with the rich young ruler? And, and it's told in three of the Gospels. But in Luke 18, Jesus just tells the rich young ruler, listen, you can come follow me. And the, the invitation is genuine. That's what you have to understand. Jesus is not trying to um, push him away. The offer is genuine. But like again, as all things, Jesus sees past the surface. And he sees this person cannot follow me if they love money more. And in, in Mark's gospel, it actually, Mark adds this one line, says this. Remember, Mark's gospel is Peter's gospel. And in Mark's gospel, it adds one line. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And the word love is agape to him. And so Jesus sees the rich young ruler and says, listen, I see that your desire to follow me is there. But your desire to follow something else is, is greater. So in order to follow me, you must get rid of this other thing. The thing with God what God always says to us, and this is the part of the Old Testament we kind of really have a hard time understanding, but God will not share us with any other gods. He will not share our attention. He's God. He's worthy of honor and glory and respect and all these words that we don't claim to. He won't share us. And so the rich young ruler hears this and he walks away. And what's interesting is, is that James is saying here, Listen, listen, early Christ followers, you're going to go out into the Roman Empire and you're going to meet people. You're going to invite them to this Jesus thing that we're starting off. If you act like everybody else, and that is you kind of kowtow towards the rich, the wealthy, the famous, you are no different than anybody else. So do not show favoritism. If somebody who's poor or somebody who's rich, both are welcome. But both, no matter what their backgrounds, no matter what their story is, both have to submit to Jesus. And if they do not, they will never follow Jesus truly. Now look what he goes on to say this in verse 8. Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. What I think is interesting is James calls one anothering. Remember, that's a phrase that we've used here, that if you look at the um, usage of the word one another in the New Testament, um, and there's, there's quite a few of them, you would actually have kind of a behavioral understanding of what a Christ follower is supposed to act like. And so James says, he calls it the royal law. He says that when we one another, when we care for one another, when we bear one another's burdens, when we pray for one another and all the words of one another, James says, this is when you act most like your King Jesus, like my big brother. And so what's interesting here is that James wants the early church to understand that. Now, he's going to wrap up in verse 12 and 13 of the first section. And he's going to say this. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you've been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. What's interesting about how he wraps up this section is he says this with these words. You will be judged by the law that sets you free. It's kind of an odd phrase to use in this, isn't it? It's like, you know, often as I've been reading through the book of James, I've been realizing how... 
how deep and how profound what James is teaching us about our own hearts. Remember we said in chapter one, the first section of chapter one was, James starts off his letter by saying, what's in your heart really? Like, who do you really love? Is it Jesus or is it something else? And he says, whether it's trials or temptations or whether it's our sin, our desires, these things will expose what we really are all about. And so James says at the end of it, he goes, you know what? However you behave, however you act, what you do, how you speak, how you treat others, that will actually also judge you as well. Once again, James is reminding the reader that a decision made in the past for Jesus does not mean an assured future outcome. Please hear me very clearly on this because we're about to shift gears here. Okay, We've been driving along in the first and second gear, but now we're about to hit the fourth gear because James is now going to use this as a backdrop for this next passage. And the next passage is going to be probably the most controversial uh, top five controversial scriptures in the New Testament. And I have no, no data for that to back that up. Absolutely. So now look at verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? This may be the most dangerous statement in the New Testament. Dangerous, absolutely, because James is saying something that nobody else is going to say. Before we can make scripture say something else, it has to say what it says first. Now, this is one of the rules we talk about here at, at Uptown Community Church, is that whatever the Bible says, however uncomfortable we are with it, how much we don't understand it, we must first allow it to say what it says first. Before we make it say something else, it just has to speak to us in its, at its first level, and then we kind of wrestle with it. So, Verse 14, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Now, just real quick here. That word, that phrase, that kind is really important because what it is saying is, it's not just about faith. He's not saying can faith save you, but he's trying to differentiate that kind of faith. Now, Dr. Stephen E. Runge, a commentator on this, is this. From the outset, James shakes us by implying that a workless faith may not be a saving faith. This is only an implication of his wording, but it has caused no shortage of heartburn for theologians over the years. This is absolutely true. Verse 14 of chapter 2 of James has upset more people than any other passage. Martin Luther, this was the passage that he looked at and said, there's no way I'm going to accept the book of James. How can, I, how can I accept this? And so verse 14 implies to us something that's very hard for us to understand. But it's not as hard to understand if you think about it. See, the focus here is not disputing whether faith is the basis of salvation. Instead, just as James contrasted the merits of hearing versus doing, he contrasts the value of faith alone versus faith that manifests itself in works. Throughout James' letter, he will attack the idea of Christianity as solely an abstract pursuit. See, Christianity is many things in culture. If, if you're at school or at work or with friends, and they, if the idea of Christianity comes up, there's lots of really weird ideas about it. But those weird ideas come from truth. And the truth is, people see how Christians act, how we behave, famous or not, uh, not famous. Right? Politicians all say that they're Christians or have some sort of religion. Uh, famous people say, yeah, I, I'm a Christian. People who never go to church say, I'm a Christian. So people are left with this idea of what is actually a Christian? Because whatever it is, it seems a lot of people adhere to it, but everyone says something different. So can we actually at least get a kind of, a, you know how they have on, uh, on uh, Twitter or Instagram, like that verified check mark? You know, like somebody has verified this person is who they say they are. Wouldn't you love to have one of those verified check marks to actually say, okay, whatever a Christian is, this person is it. Yeah, I'm not sure if any of us would get a verified check mark at that point in time, but it's a neat idea, right? So what James is saying is, however you understand Christianity, however you understand following Jesus, you have to first understand that it's not just simply an abstract concept. It's not a mental pursuit. It's not an acknowledgement in your mind only. Now, what's interesting about James is, is Martin Luther and others kind of, kind of attack James. But the problem is, is James is just aligned with Jesus. 
Throughout Jesus' teaching, and again, this is some examples of it, Jesus says the exact same thing that James does, but James, like no one can attack Jesus, of course, so James, the little brother of Jesus, gets attacked for it. And I think Martin Luther, if he just went back and read the Gospels once more, he would see exactly what James is saying. Look at um, Matthew chapter 3, verse 8. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Could you imagine if you said that you're a Christian and someone said, prove it? Could you imagine if on a census, if it gives you, you know, the different kinds of religions and, and you, you marked Christianity and all of a sudden dropped down menu and said, prove it? What would you say? What would you do? How, how, how would you do it? Well, I, I don't know. Like, 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 look, I got a tattoo of something or I've got this or I've got a fish on my car or, or I got to prove it somehow. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, prove the way you, uh, prove that you follow me by the way you live. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. As a tree is identified by its fruit, if a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. Jesus uses the idea of fruit a lot. Right now, understand, a fruit is the output of a plant, of a, of a tree, right? And only healthy trees produce fruit. As a matter of fact, what's interesting in the biological sense is that things only reproduce if they're healthy. Right? You have to have extra resources to reproduce in the biological realm. And so Jesus says that if you're healthy, if you are good, then you'll produce fruit. Right? He says that's how you know if, if something is good or bad. Not by, you know, it looks like a beautiful tree. It's a beautiful looking tree or it's a nice tree or a tree has lots of memories for me. I remember, you know, seeing that tree when I was a child. These things don't matter to Jesus. Jesus says, does it have fruit? And is it a good fruit? Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 20. And the seed that fell in good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much has been planted. Produce? What do you mean produce? Isn't it enough that I've just accepted the seed? Three other soils did, but Jesus says they were in good soils. Why? What's the only thing that separates the good soil from the three bad soils? The good soil produces. Look at John chapter 5, verses 2 and 5. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit. Stop there for a second. He cuts off every branch of mine. What's he saying? He's not saying, oh, he cuts off any branch in the world. Why? Because if someone has decided I haven't to follow Jesus yet, they're not his. What Jesus is saying is very particular here. He's saying he cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce. Look at verse 5 in that part. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Will? Not might. Not perhaps. Maybe could. Maybe they have time. Maybe if they, they really want to or are having a good day or bad day. Will. It's, it's a definitive statement of what takes place if you're in Jesus. Look at Matthew 7, 19 to 20. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruits, so you can identify what? People by their actions. Whatever the conversation that James had with Jesus when Jesus had his post-resurrection appearance, it's almost as if James understood something about Jesus' teaching that Paul never did that Peter never quite uh, illustrated. And it's one of the reasons why James was elevated in the, in, in the church in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, people acknowledge that James was the head of the church in Jerusalem. And we see this in Acts chapter 15. So what's interesting is what James is saying is taking a piece of Jesus' teaching that we ignore completely because it makes us really uncomfortable. And James is saying, you know what? Jesus said this to yourself. Jesus said the exact same thing I'm saying, but Martin Luther's beaten up on me, right? Basically, he's saying, you will be known by your beliefs, by your behavior. Now, let's go on here because he keeps going on. Look at verse 19 and 20. You say you have faith for you believe and there is one God. Good for you. Good for you. I feel like this feels like a sarcastic tone there, right? Even the demons believe this and they tremble in their terror. How foolish. Remember, James loves that word foolish, right? He talks about it it twice already about the foolishness of, of our faith. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? 
So what James is saying is, you believe something, great, that's acknowledgement in your head. But unless your behavior lines up with your belief, you're actually fooling yourself. And in chapter 1, James has already said that twice. Right? We talked about that last week and the week before that in self-delusion. We are deluding ourselves if we actually think we're a Christ follower, if our behavior does not align with our beliefs. Passive faith is dead faith to James. And dead faith is, is equivalent to no faith. So how would you test? I, I, really, I really wanted to do like a test of, of that. I thought, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. But at Uptown Community Church, we actually have, um, not a test, but there's, there's areas that we talk about that we want to have. So in, if you were in a hostage situation, I know, odd, odd choice, one of the things you would ask for is something called proof of life. Right, because you're negotiating with somebody who has somebody that's close to you, but before you pay the price that they are asking, you want to make sure that that person is alive. It's called proof of life. So at Uptown Community Church, we have this phrase that we talk about. We talk about time, talents, and treasure. We say that at Uptown Community Church, we're not just talking to you about you know this part of your life. We want every part of your life brought before God. So. What does that look like on a Canadian context as far as Christians? Well, as you do some studies, you kind of realize, as far as time go, that only 13% of Canadians attend church weekly. 13%, and yet over 60% would self-identify as a Christian. Now, understand something. This church idea, and this is actually what our theology pub is on this Sunday, um, is this idea of like, however you wrap your mind around church or your faith community, or whatever it would be, and I don't, we're not here to, that's not what we're talking about this morning. It is in understanding within the early church, a sign of what you believe. And yet only 13% of Canadians attend church weekly. Now, if you were to say, and if you were to kind of crunch down those numbers down a little bit further, what, what does regular attendance to a church look like? Like regular commitment to a faith community look like? And in that, it actually drops down to about 7%. Right? So semi-regular or, or irregular would be about once a month or twice a month. That'd be irregular. Regular is actually only three out of four. So that's what be, that was what, how they define regular. And so what's interesting is this behavior of, of our time, right? And again, I could, I could, I could show you uh, whether data um, on how many people read the Bible on a daily basis or take time for prayer, not praying before a meal, but actually focused prayer. It's, you know, these numbers are kind of small. When we talk about this idea of talent, and when we say about talent, we say, you know what? We want you to take your abilities to serve, to serve other people. And we see that in the context of the, our faith community, but also in the world as well, too. And just so you know, all these statistics I'm going to show it to you are, are always about Christians. Because, of course, we don't judge other people who do, haven't decided to follow Jesus by the same standards that we judge ourselves. Because we are hold to a higher standard, and that higher standard is always Jesus. Well, approximately 40% of a church population volunteers on a regular basis. So basically, 4 out of 10 people will take time out of their week, take time to serve, whether in a church context, or in a community context. So four out of ten, that's, that, again, feels kind of small when you think about what it is. We talk about treasure, right? Treasure is the resources God has given us. On average, Christians give 2.5% to the church. If you make 75000 or plus more, your income, uh, in, in income families, you only will give 1%. This is based on 2017 uh, on... Um, Stats Canada. The average giving for a person uh, per year is $551 per person giving versus, I thought, you know, we have to compare this, right? Uh, How do we compare $551 to the church? So on average, people spend $1,098 on alcohol consumption in the year. So twice as much as what they would give to the church, they spend on alcohol. And with that as well, too, I thought, well, what else do we have as far as, you know, just like spending that we get to do, we get to kind of do what we want. We know that there's rent, you got our mortgage, you got to pay that. And then we know there's cell phone, you got to pay that, right? We know these type of things, right? But what do we use the money that's left over? How do we use it? Well, what's interesting is that the the average Canadian, and this is based in 2018, will spend $3,584.40, 40 cents is important, on eating out. This is versus what we would give to the local church. Now, the reason I say this to you is, please hear me very clearly. Uptown Community Church, 
we don't do the whole guilt shame thing. We don't. We 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 we'd prefer people to be what they are based upon their encounter with Jesus. We want the Holy Spirit to work us and to transform us. But what this does, though, it does give us a bit of a snapshot with Christianity within Canadian context. And what we can say is our behavior is not lining up with our belief to, the, to, to a large extent. And why this is important is why this is what uh, we have to kind of bring this. And as uncomfortable as this conversation is, it's uncomfortable to think that people will spend twice as much on alcohol. And these are Christians. These are not non-Christians. These are Christians. People spend twice as much on alcohol as they will giving to the local church. Now, your resources, we talk about this all the time, they're yours. Do what you want with them. But remember what James says, though. The law that frees you will also judge you. Right? The law that frees you. This uh, Friday, no, not this Friday, next Friday, I'm speaking at University of Guelph. And the idea, the concept they've asked me to come talk about is legalism. Understanding legalism within the church. How do you understand legalism and, and how do you get past that? And, and the thing is, though, it's a really interesting concept because on the one hand, legalism says, you know, you earn God's favor by your, by your actions. But that's actually not correct, though. Right? God loves you. He cares about you. But he loves you so much, he refuses to leave you as you are. That whatever Christianity was meant to be, whatever Christianity is supposed to be, is a call to transformation. But the problem is we are not being transformed. Christianity has become um, an abstract concept we hold in our heads, but our behavior may not be aligning with what we say we are. And the disconnect from that misalignment, I think is what the world is picking up on. Right? If we as Christians are acting and behaving on social media, just like everybody else, like where's that love? How does that one another look like on, on social media? If we are acting and behaving in, in the workplace, at school, in a cutthroat manner, in a way that doesn't care for other people, how do we actually convince them that Jesus is important to us, that Jesus has transformed us, that Jesus has died for us, and that he's our focal point when we don't act or behave as if that is true? You see why this is so uncomfortable and why people really hate James chapter 2? Because he calls into account the stuff that we don't like to talk about. And what he calls into account is our life. He says, great that you have faith. Great that you decide at youth camp or at in children's church or wherever it would be you decide to follow Jesus. Good for you. And he actually says, good for you. But he says, that's not enough. Because that's only the starting point of this journey of faith, this transformation within Jesus. Remember we've been saying this at Uptown Community Church a little bit. We've been saying that, why do we have churches full of Christians who don't resemble Jesus? Because we have a group of people who refuse to be transformed. That we've acknowledged Christ as a religion we've ticked off as a, in a box or a religion we decide to follow. But that transformation, whatever that looks like, that taking up of our cross, our dying to ourselves, hasn't happened. Now look what James does. He gives two examples of individuals, and I think it's interesting that he uses a male and a female as the example. So good for James on this one, right? And so James gives us two examples of individuals who by their actions show that their belief is true. In verse 21, he talks about Abraham, right? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions? Right with God by his actions. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions, right? By her actions. How do you show that you are right with God? By your actions. How do you show that you are not right with God? By your actions. Whatever we want to understand about Christianity, whatever we want to understand about faith, and please hear me very clearly, this is the text. This is not a pastor getting up here to hit you over the head. You guys know how I preach, how I teach. We take the Bible and we just take it literally and we say, okay, how do we understand it with the context of culture, the context of history? For sure. But before it can say something else, it has to say what it says first. And James is very concerned that people are out in the Roman Empire calling themselves followers of Jesus and acting and behaving like every other Roman uh, citizen. And to James, that's not good enough. He would rather you not call yourself a Christian at all so you don't bring shame to the gospel. And he's going to unpack that in further chapters. Now, watch this, verse 22. His faith and his actions, this is Abraham, worked together. His actions made his faith complete. 
Now, this word complete that he uses is so interesting. It's almost as if he's saying that you can have faith, but if you don't have actions, it's only half right. But if you have actions without faith, you're only half right. See, on the other hand, what James doesn't talk about too much, but he says this in a way that you kind of understand the one or the other, is that, by the way, if you're out there and you're serving, you're giving, you're doing, you're all these things, but your heart is far from God, that's also incomplete. Let me kind of show you this way. Um, so on the one hand, we have faith. And when we, when we use the word faith, what we're really saying is the inner life, right? That's our prayer time. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to us, hearing the voice of God, meditating, fasting, the spiritual disciplines. These are the internal mechanisms by which we try to create space in our lives for God. One of the reasons why we've changed the service, way we do church here at, at UCC, and putting the sermon right in the middle of the service rather than the end, is because we want to give you time to think, to pray, to meditate at the end of the t- teaching so that you're not just rushing out. We are trying to create more space for God's presence in our service, which kind of seems like makes sense that the church would want to do that. So what James is saying is faith is this inner part of our lives, right? But works, that's serving, giving, witnessing, and all the other stuff that goes along with it, Right? Now, the reason James offends us is that we have seen Christianity as binary. Now, what I mean by binary is off, on, good, bad, right? Two things. But what if there's a third option? And what James tells us is the third option is the complete option, where works and faith work together. And unless you have both of them together, you are incomplete. So say, for example, you serve every week at a soup kitchen. And you're giving half your income away to uh, poor people in the church. And you are doing lots of stuff. But your inner life, the part of you that no one sees, you don't spend, you're not spending time with God. You're not spending time in prayer. You're not reading the word. You're not, you're not asking for the Holy Spirit to transform you. James would say that's, that's, that's incomplete. On the other hand, though, say, for example, you go to lots of prayer meetings, you, read, you memorize lots of scripture, and you're very a spiritual person, but you don't do anything? James says, well, that's incomplete. I remember when I was growing up, and because of my background, I come from a charismatic background, we love prayer meetings. I never quite understood why people like to bow their heads and mumble, but that was what we called prayer meetings. That was what I understood as a prayer meeting. And I remember one time, the prayer meeting was for the lost, Right, we're going to have a prayer meeting for the lost of Waterloo because I grew up in Waterloo, right? So the church up the street I used to attend on a regular basis. And we were going to have a prayer meeting for the lost of the city. And I remember asking that all because I was like, I was kind of a smart alecky kid, which I'm sure you have no problem believing. But I remember asking an adult one time, like, rather than praying for the lost, why don't we just go out and meet them? Go share what we're talking about. Let's go, you know, let's not pray for the lost. Let's, just, let's go hang out with them. Let's go talk to them. That's not what we do. He didn't say it like that, but that's how I, I interpret it in my head, right? But it's like, oh, well, like, we love the prayer meetings. We love coming together in prayer meetings, and that was great, and we want to pray, and of course, we want to pray. But what if we prayed first and then went out and met people, did something, right? Incomplete. And the church has struggled with this, right? You have some denominations that are so amazing in regards to practical help for the poor. And that's fantastic. But they have to always balance that with the inner life. And there's some denominations that get the inner life properly, right? They get the spiritual disciplines properly, but they don't do anything. And so it's kind of like, how do we balance the two? And that's all that James is saying. The reason why we are so offended by this and the reason why Martin Luther is so offended by this is all James is saying is, listen, take your inner life and balance it with your outer life. That's complete faith. And unless you balance it, your faith is actually... How does James say it? Uh, It's incomplete. It's not really working as God would want. Now, what's interesting is Jesus does the exact same thing. The book of Matthew, when you break it down as far as, um, I'm going to close here with this, uh, with two more slides here. In Matthew, there's two times that Jesus talks about something called the sheep and the goats, this idea of judgment, right? People standing before God. The first time he talks about it is at the end of Matthew chapter 7. Now, remember, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is a sermon on the mount. 
It's Jesus' thesis statement for the kingdom of heaven. Right? Blessed are those who mourn. Right? Um, if 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 you're if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery with her. Right? This is this is Jesus' manifesto for the kingdom of heaven. And at the end of it, look what he says. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I'll reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. And so in Matthew's version, Matthew 7's version, what, what, what makes people be rejected by God is that relationship, the knowing. But in Matthew 25, now remember, Matthew 25 is important because what happens in Matthew 26? Easter, Passover, Right? Jesus is about to march to the cross. So Matthew 25 is the last teaching Jesus has for his disciples. And again, he tells the same story about people coming before God and being rejected or accepted. Now look at this one, though. And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. And so in both stories, Jesus says there's an eternal consequence to what you believe and how you behave. And Matthew bookends it in his gospel at two pivotal points, one at the, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount and the other right before the Easter week. And the reason I think I, I wrestled with these two passages uh, for many years because I couldn't understand how to align them. Because on the one hand, Jesus says rejection is this. And the other hand, Jesus says rejection is that. My problem was I was thinking binary. If and, yes, no, one, two. And, Jane, and, and Matthew is saying it's both. Unless you get both of these right, unless you align both of these up in your life, you will stand before God and he will say to you, I don't know who you are. But, but God, I, I, I went to church every Sunday. But God, I, 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 I fed the poor. I don't know if God will actually say that, but you know, you get the idea, right? What James is saying here is so important, and we have to make sure we understand this. Our inner life and our outer life must align. Now, it doesn't mean it has to be perfect. We don't walk around paranoid going, ah. As a matter of fact, one of the things I think is so interesting, and the Bible gets this, but we haven't gotten this in the church today. But in the Bible, in the Psalms, for example, when David messes up before God, they put it in the book and they sing about it. You remember that time when David killed uh, Bathsheba's husband and slept with her? Yeah, that's a worship song. It's in their worship book, people. This is what they would sing about, and they'd be reminded about their leader's failure. And what they would do is just be honest. And what David would say is, listen, I did that, but I love God. And what the Bible says about me, I have a heart after God. Even in my sin, even in my failing, even in my brokenness, brokenness, I still pursue God. And so we don't have to walk around paranoid going, ah, I'm going to mess up. As a matter of fact, when you mess up, it's a great conversation to say, I'm still trying. I'm still trying to get to where God wants me to. I'm still trying to figure it out. When you lose your temper, when you act, behave, whatever it would be, it's like the apology, right? The sorry, but the sorry with, you know, I'm sorry I lost my temper. I'm sorry, you know, this or that, whatever it would be. It's like, I'm still broken. I'm still fallen. James wraps up this chapter with this really unique verse. And he says this in verse 26, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Can you just wrap your mind around that for a second? He's just gone through favoritism, which is still behavior. He's just gone through faith and, 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 and belief, belief and behavior. And he says this at the very end. He says, listen, if you're a Christ follower and you don't act like a Christ follower, you're dead. You're like a body without breath. And that offends us. That hurts us. And that's the point. Is that we can get so lulled into the abstraction of Christianity and forget that there's meant to be a transformed behavior. We take our time, we take our talents, we take our treasures. And we say, Lord, open hand in hand. We say, Lord, however you want to use this, whatever you want to do with this, I give it to you. I give my everything. I don't hold anything back. I don't hold the, the gross stuff of my life. And I don't hold the good stuff of my life. I give both to you. 
Because when I give both to you, I am balanced before you. Because the only thing I want to hear from God at the end of my life, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's it. Not, Roger, wow, you really messed up. Wow, you really, you really screwed up. You're, wow, you really, so no, I just want to hear God's words to me. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's all I want to hear at the end. And I want to make sure that my life, my behavior, and my belief are aligned. Let's pray. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, we're going to just take an opportunity to kind of reflect. And as we've done over the last several weeks, we're going to do again this morning, is we're going to take an opportunity to kind of reflect and, and to sing and just to have that opportunity to worship. But before, before we do that, James has just challenged us. He's asked us a very uncomfortable question. And you can fluff it off. You can, you can say, well, that's then, that's not now. But honestly, you have to wrestle with it. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters of Uptown Community Church, if you say you have faith, but you behave how you want to behave throughout the week? Can such a faith save you? It is completely uncomfortable to even ask that question. I understand that. I have been wrestling with this the entire week as I'm being prepared to teach this morning on it. It's like, how do I... Part of me was like, how do I downplay it? How do I make it nicer? How do I just try to find a way to turn it around so it doesn't seem so bleak? But the fact is, James lays it there and you have to take it. But it is a reminder. The world won't believe what we say if we don't live what we say, they, they just won't. How can we tell them that Jesus is worth everything, that he's our savior, that he's our Lord, that everything that we have is for him when we live for ourselves, when we act and behave like everybody else in school, at work, at, in our families, our friends? How, how can they even come close to believing? Can such a faith save we are going to take an opportunity to worship. And we're going to worship in a couple of ways. We're going to worship this morning with our tithes and offerings we've been doing. But we're going to sing some songs. And as we do that as well, too, one of the things we've started as well is to have time for prayer. And so as we have done over the last several weeks, I'm going to be at the front here. And I'm going to uh, pray with you if, if you want to come forward for prayer. And the reason we do so is so that we are able to say, Lord, I'm wrestling with this and I just need prayer. Over the next several weeks, you're going to see people added to the prayer team and, and we're going to have other individuals up there to pray for people so that we can say, hey, you want prayer. You want to talk to somebody. You want to just have somebody to lay hands and pray for you. At the end of this series, James ends off with prayer and we're going to have an anointing service. We're going to anoint people with oil. Whatever the, whatever the needs are, whatever it would be, we are going to have, we're going to commit the entire service to this, this focus on prayer because that's how James wraps up his letter. We believe God hears us. We believe that God loves us and cares for us. We just need to give God more space in our, time, in our lives. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you love us. You love us so much that you refuse to let us stay the way we are. God, our prayer is that in Jesus' name that we would be transformed. Lord, we don't want to just pretend to be Christians. We don't want to pretend to follow you, but Lord, we want to do so fully and completely. And Lord, we know that we're sinful, we know that we're broken, but God, by your Holy Spirit, you call us to something more, something beautiful, something profound. And I pray in Jesus' name for each person in this room that they would wrestle, they would grasp a hold of that. God, I thank you as we take this time now to sing, and if people want prayer, whatever it be, Lord, that we would just take opportunity to reflect upon this. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.